tonight, catching a serial bomber, asylum seekers find religion, and the high priest of blockchain. Congratulations, God bless. Facebook CEO Mark Zuckerberg finally posted a Facebook message of his own today, addressing the Cambridge Analytica scandal. He admitted that his company made mistakes and outlined new security measures to limit app developers' access to your data. Among other steps, developers will now only be able to see your name, photo, and email address. Notably absent from Zuckerberg's message, any mention of why Facebook never notified the millions of users whose data was taken and retained by Cambridge Analytica when it learned about the issue in 2015. Emotional families celebrated as the terrorist group Boko Haram returned at least 104 of 110 girls to the town it abducted them from last month. According to bystanders, members of Boko Haram, which roughly translates to Western education is forbidden, warned families that their daughters would be kidnapped again if they went back to school. Reports say several of the girls died in the group's custody. Nigeria's president tweeted that back-channel negotiations led to the release and that the government did not pay Boko Haram a ransom. Hundreds of Kentucky public school teachers rallied today to protest a bill that would slash their retirement benefits. At least seven districts closed school to allow teachers to attend the rally. Kentucky is tens of billions of dollars short of being able to pay out its pensions over the next 30 years. The legislation tries to address that in part by cutting cost of living adjustments for retired teachers and eliminating pensions for future ones. Attorney General Jeff Sessions released guidance today, strongly encouraging federal prosecutors to pursue the death penalty in drug-related cases that qualify for it. The memo implements part of the plan President Trump pitched Monday to combat the opioid crisis, and it cites statutes already in place where the death penalty can be used, certain racketeering charges, and dealing in, quote, extremely large quantities of drugs, among others. Kosovo's Nationalist Opposition Party threw tear gas canisters in Parliament in an effort to disrupt a vote today. The vote was on a border demarcation agreement with neighboring Montenegro, a European Union precondition to letting people from Kosovo travel without visas to nearby countries. The Opposition Party claims Kosovo will lose 20,000 acres in the deal, though the government disputes that. The U.S. ambassador condemned the violence and urged Kosovo to vote for the deal as a yes for Europe. Lawmakers eventually ratified the agreement this evening. Angela Merkel addressed Germany's parliament for the first time today as the country's newly sworn-in chancellor, after a trying six months piecing together a coalition government. Outlining her plans for a fourth term, Merkel voiced a tougher stance on migrants. Das bedeutet dann aber auch, dass diejenigen, die keinen Anspruch auf Schutz haben, unser Land wieder verlassen müssen. Am besten über freiwillige Rückkehrprogramme mit einer Starthilfe im Heimatland, notfalls auch durch staatlich angeordnete Rückführung. Some foreigners trying to avoid exactly that outcome aren't putting their faith in the government but in a different set of beliefs. Der Friede des Herrn sei mit euch allen. Amen. Im Namen Jesu Christi gebiete ich dir, weiche du unreiner Geist. At a traditional Lutheran church service, Salman Barbary is hoping to start a new chapter in his life. Jesus Christus Hat dich am Kreuz erlöst. Born in Iran to a strict Muslim family from Afghanistan, Barbary is getting baptized along with nine other migrants. So frage ich auch dich, lieber Bruder. Euer Islam war Payam Barash Mohammad. Bale man rat mikonan. Elias Salman Barbari. Ich taufe dich im Namen des Vaters. He came to this church last fall when he fled to Germany from Sweden after the Swedes rejected his asylum application. 
شک داشتم بین اسلام و مسیحیت یه وقت از خودم و به ایسای مسیح سپردم زندگیم بهتر شد Under Islamic law, Barbary could be sent to jail in Iran for converting to Christianity. In Afghanistan, he could be put to death. And that's the reason he may be able to stay in Berlin. Under German law, migrants can't be deported if they face persecution at home. A fact that's not lost on Barbary, who plans to seek asylum here at the end of the month. You're going to apply as a Christian. Do you think that's going to have any impact on your application? پناهندگی و اینجور چیزا ندادم. من به خاطر اون پیام خوش انجیلی که به من داده شد به خاطر اون خوشحالم. There are people who believe that the reason why you're doing this is to increase your chances of you getting asylum in Germany. اگه میشد کل آدم ها اونایی که فکر میکنن که ما به خاطر قبولی اومدیم یه چهار پنج ماهی داخل کلیسا به عنوان پناهجو به عنوان عضو کلیسا یا پناهنده کلیسا Right now, Barbary is living at Trinity Lutheran and hiding from police who traditionally don't enter churches. More than 20 other migrants are there with him. They're waiting out the six-month statute of limitations for extradition to the EU countries that rejected their original asylum applications. So this is as far as you can go on the church grounds. Yeah, the last place we can go is میتونیم بریم اگه پلیس ما رو بگیره دیگه ما هیچ مسئولیت در عهده کلیسا نیست و میتونن ما رو دیپورت کنن. Gott möchte, dass wir in unserem Leben fröhlich sind. خدا میخواد که ما توی زندگیامون خوشحال باشیم. Pastor Gottfried Martins has been tending to migrants at this church since 2015. 1400 out of 1600 congregants are Iranian and Afghan. Some were Christians back home. But Martin's baptized hundreds of others. He says the German government has rejected more than 90% of their recent asylum applications, often because they do not think the migrants are real Christians. Is there anyone that's come here that you've then discovered actually your motivations aren't honest? Of course, before we baptize somebody, uh, we always have thorough examinations. And if those people do not convince me, I will not baptize them. Out of those who come to us and say we want to have baptismal class, perhaps one third finally is baptized. What do you have to say to the government with regards to those who have converted to Christianity from your congregation that are applying for asylum? The state is a kind of secular version of the Holy Inquisition because the state says we can look into the heart of those pe- hearts of those people and can say who is a true Christian or not. The German government doesn't track asylum applications based on religious grounds. But it did process more asylum applications than all other EU countries combined in the months leading up to Germany's 2017 election. That year, voters turned against Angela Merkel's migrant-friendly policies and far-right sympathizers marched in the streets. Since then, asylum approvals have dropped. Andrea Lintholz is from the governing Christian Social Union. Pastor Martin says that he is a man of the church, he's a man of God, he knows these men, that they are good men, but now, in the congregation receiving a lot of rejections which are politically motivated, Die Entscheider beim Bundesamt für Migration und Flüchtlinge müssen sich jeden Fall individuell anschauen. Das sind eben verschiedene Umstände, die eine Rolle spielen. Wie hat jemand vorher in seinem Land gelebt? Wie hat er vielleicht auch dort seinen Glauben ausgeübt? Warum hat er sich dazu entschlossen zu wechseln und wie lebt er das aus? Und da kann der Pfarrer immer nur ein Aspekt sein, aber nie ausschließlich der einzige Aspekt. Pastor Martin says that if these men are forced to return to their countries, then the government will have blood on their hands. Also zum einen kann alleine die Konvertierung zum christlichen Glauben nicht dazu führen, dass wir jeden Asylbescheid als korrekt bezeichnen. Wenn die Erkenntnisse insgesamt ergeben, dass man die Vermutung hat, es ist jemand nur zum christlichen Glauben gewechselt, um hier zu bleiben, ist das ein Problem, ja. Hundreds of thousands of migrants have appealed the rejection of their asylum applications in German courts, and Barbary could soon be one of them. So far, about half of those appeals are successful. Martins takes some solace in that. Is there anything that would stop you from doing what you're currently doing? Death. 
not be far. Authorities in central Texas confirmed today that the serial bomber in Austin is dead. The suspect, a 23-year-old white male named Mark Anthony Condit, blew himself up inside his car while being pursued by law enforcement early this morning. The investigation into how the bombings were carried out is ongoing, but officials said being able to reconstruct the devices helps them figure out their suspect. To the public, they may look all different, but when you look at the internal components, they're very similar to us. And to, from laboratory analysis, we know that it's the same person who manufactured these. But the motive for the bombings that killed two people is still a mystery. And that's one reason why finding Condit was so difficult. From the moment the first bomb allegedly set by Mark Anthony Condit went off on March 2nd, it took law enforcement nearly three weeks to get an idea of who had been sowing terror across Austin and to track him to his home here in the suburbs. That wasn't surprising. Serial bombings like this one are notoriously difficult cases for law enforcement to crack. That's why the Unabomber, for example, was able to remain at large for almost 17 years. Tom Thurman is the former head of the FBI Explosives Unit. Most of the time, the person who built that bomb and set the bomb down or put it in the mail is not there when the bomb explodes. That is what makes bombing cases at the beginning more difficult to investigate. In 1990, Thurman helped catch Walter Leroy Moody, a serial bomber who terrorized the Southeast with a series of mail bombs that killed two people. In that case, as in Austin, investigators succeeded in finding a signature in the bomber's materials and methods, in part because they were able to intercept bombs before they exploded. For a forensic examiner, that is a dream come true to have a device that has been taken apart by a bomb squad and not exploded, and to have all the componentry there to, to look at. And what that does, that reduces the amount of time that you would have to spend in the identification process in, in the laboratory. In Austin, that forensic work played a key role in solving the case. According to NBC News, the bombs contained unusual batteries that investigators were able to trace back to Condit. They were then able to track his purchases of other bomb components, and they also got a search warrant for his Google search history. Investigators then caught a break when the bomber suddenly changed a very important aspect of his MO. Before last weekend, all of the bombs were delivered directly in by hand. They were left as packages on people's doorsteps, or in one case, set up with a tripwire by the side of the road. But on Sunday, the bomber dropped off two packages at FedEx, where he was recorded by security cameras wearing gloves and a blonde wig as a disguise. The cameras also captured the vehicle he was driving and its license plate. One of the two packages he dropped off contained the bomb that was later intercepted before it exploded. At that point, the authorities were able to close in very quickly. Within 24 hours, they used Condit's cell phone records to place him near the scenes of the bombings. According to Texas Governor Greg Abbott, investigators also found that Condit had purchased five signs at a Home Depot that read caution children at play, one of which the tripwire bomb had been attached to. When Condit turned his cell phone on on Tuesday night, the authorities tracked him to a hotel in Round Rock, north of Austin. That's what makes being a serial bomber in 2018 different from being one when Moody or the Unabomber were active. From the moment Condit started making his bombs, he was leaving digital fingerprints and an electronic trail, as we all do, so that even if he wasn't present when the bombs went off, traces of him were. In a wetland way out in the California desert, researchers have installed a 900-foot metal chute full of slimy green algae. It's part of an experiment to clean up polluted water, but scientists are also trying to turn the algae into a renewable source of fuel, and they're being bankrolled by a powerful backer, the Department of Energy. So there's algae everywhere. There's something like 100,000 different strains of algae in the world, and they adapt to whatever environment they're in. This is California's Salton Sea, an artificial lake that formed when an irrigation channel broke and overflowed in 1905. 
the lake is slowly drying up. And the only water flowing into it is agricultural runoff, which is polluted with fertilizers and pesticides. One of the few things that can thrive in these extreme conditions is algae. Ryan Davis is the head scientist overseeing the DOE's algae growing operation. Walk me through this process here. What exactly is going on? Today we're just harvesting biomass that has been growing over the past couple of weeks. We call paraphytic algae that are in the water around us. So it's ubiquitous algae that just will grow if you give them the right conditions. Does that make you algae farmers? How does <laughs> well, that work, like as a scientist? We call ourselves scum ranchers. The scum filters the water, removing agricultural residues that would have flowed from the wetlands around the algae farm into one of California's most toxic lakes. We're sourcing from the local wetlands here that are a part of essentially an environmental restoration project related to the salt and sea. So you're taking water from the wetlands, you're pumping it through here using solar power, mm -hmm. and then you're essentially using algae that just grows naturally in this kind of condition to clean that water. That's correct. The stuff that we don't want in the water is helping it grow. Exactly. The clean water, where does it go? It goes back into the wetlands. The DOE is calling this the Salton Sea Biomass Remediation Project, but it's interested in more than just cleaning a polluted lake. What the government really wants is a source of renewable energy, and it's spending 600,000 a year on salt and sea research. For the past year, Ryan's team has been harvesting algae, which is sent to Sandia National Laboratories, where scientists work to turn it into a high-quality fuel. It's early days for their research, but Ryan was eager to prove that algae fuel will burn. It burns. It burns. <laughs> it smells way better than gasoline, I have to say. Have you actually been able to try this out in a car? Like, have you driven a car? No, they've only been in test engines, but I really, really want to put this in a go-kart and do donuts in the parking lot. This is not the first time algae fuels have been tested. Venture capitalists invested hundreds of millions in algae in the early 2000s. But the bubble burst when increasing production to a commercial scale proved impossible. One problem was algae crashes, where pests and diseases would kill entire crops. But the DOE's under pressure to meet ambitious targets for biofuel use. By 2022, the economy's supposed to consume 36 billion gallons a year. So they're not giving up on algae yet. Dan Fishman works at the DOE's Bioenergy Technology Office and says one way to give algae a second chance is to make it more pest resistant. So, so this is the place where algae goes to die at Sandia Labs. Yeah, that's right. So one thing that Sandia does is use it as a what we call a pond crash. So they'll bring in things that kill or eat algae mm -hmm. and develop strategies to resist those pathogens and predators. If we're successful, the fuels from algae are going to be in the cars we drive, the jets we fly on, the trains that move cargo. Is this about replacing oil? Oh yeah, definitely. Yeah? Yes. You know, that can be controversial, but I think if you look into the future, I don't have a crystal ball, but intrinsically, things you dig out of the ground, there's a finite supply. Patrick Byrne is celebrating one of his newest startups with friends, colleagues, and a bunch of people who just want five minutes of his time. That's our clock. Oh, wow. I don't have a card on me. Byrne is used to networking. His father was the CEO of Geico and a close friend of Warren Buffett. And he's the founder of popular deal site Overstock.com. But this is a different world. Make some noise for the CEO and his mother. This is the land of Bitcoin enthusiasts, where Byrne has become a crypto god. I so appreciated the philosophical underpinnings of what you're talking about. So, all right, I'm a fanboy. Do you mind shoes off in my place? And you're going to try to disguise the place I live so I don't get weirdos? 
We don't want weirdos. Although you did invite us here, so. I did. Okay, welcome. Vern lives alone in a three-story concrete ski chalet. He's never been married and has no kids. He's more of a cat person. This is my friend, Master Poe. You'll notice she is vision impaired. And this, this is Che Guevara, and she has two eyes. Byrne, who's a three-time cancer survivor, has a doctorate in philosophy and an authentic Chinese opium bed. He loves chess and water sports. That sling is for an injury he sustained in Nicaragua while surfing. Where's this Hash gun? that for me, oh, yeah, find the course. sticky side and just... So just go right here? Yeah. But what he's most interested in right now is finding a way to undermine what he believes are oppressive financial institutions that control society. These institutions that we get told are neutral and they're governing society neutrally, they really get captured, economists like to say, and they become the tools of powerful to oppress the weak. This might seem like an odd obsession for someone with Burns' pedigree, but he's been at war with Wall Street for almost two decades. I've been on a dozen or times or more to talk about how to fix Wall Street. Heavy centralized institutions, a lot of dirty business going on on Wall Street. And he often uses his company, Overstock, as a weapon. In 2002, Overstock became one of the first companies to go public outside of Wall Street by using something called the Dutch IPO, which raises money directly from the public. In 2007, Overstock sued a bunch of short sellers for allegedly trying to depress the company's share price. And then, Byrne found Bitcoin. I'd like to give you my make Bitcoin great again hat, but you got to promise to wear it as you walk down the street in New York. I can wear it once while walking around. Okay. <laughs> when you first saw Bitcoin, did you think, this thing's pretty cool? Do you remember what you thought when you, when you first encountered it? Or when I first heard of Bitcoin, it reminded me of my feelings about gold. And so I liked it. I was, I'm an Austrian economist by sort of background and inclination. So uh, I distrust the idea of central banking. In 2014, Overstock became the first large company to accept the cryptocurrency as a form of payment. And was there interest when you actually implemented it? Well, truth is people don't spend it much. They, it's really about 0.2% of our sales, a fifth of 1% of our sales. I didn't really think we were going to get a monster amount of business from it. It was I wanted our technology team to get familiar with it. Accepting Bitcoin turned Burn into a household name in the crypto community. And Overstock shares have trended pretty closely to Bitcoin's price ever since. But for Burn, Bitcoin was never what really mattered. The main event of Bitcoin isn't really Bitcoin. It's this, this blockchain technology. Okay, tell me, tell me like I'm five years old. What is this blockchain technology? Imagine a ledger. But imagine this is a magic ledger and has a few interesting properties. One is it's immutable. When, I, when you write something there, it can never be erased. Secondly, there are other copies of this ledger all over the world. And when you change something here, it magically simultaneously changes there. And in addition, the whole thing is protected cryptographically. It's a machine that generates trust. That's what blockchain does. Generating trust between strangers is also a big part of what financial institutions do, which is why Byrne thinks blockchain can eventually make those institutions oh. obsolete. You started without me, good. I thought you were just me. And why he's putting so much of his time, money, and reputation into making blockchain a mainstream technology. I have a very direct sense of purpose now. To be honest, I was on the verge of retiring. I was on the verge of selling the retail business and retiring. You want to tell them about DeSoto? What is going on there? We're sending down the team for 10 days to work closely with our uh, users. Byrne now travels the world evangelizing about the potential of blockchain. He's also created a venture capital firm within Overstock that uses the company's money to invest in blockchain startups. <laughs> we want blockchain meets the creation of capital, which is land titling. Blockchain meets central banking. And blockchain meets voting. What about the, how many people? The effort that's furthest possible? along is T0, a startup that targets his favorite enemy, Wall Street. It sets up a platform that will compete with traditional stock exchanges. You know when you're a kid and you buy a baseball card and here's my baseball card and here's your dollar or whatever, and you know, we let go at the same time? I mean, that's like a trade. A blockchain-based system is like that. It's the, the money and the stock are changing ownership at the same time. So currently, people pay 
maybe $15. If you have a stock brokerage account and you call your broker, you're paying $15 to execute a trade. That $15 you're paying is feeding a lot of mouths all through this plumbing. Well, that plumbing can all be kind of eliminated and you have a much simpler system that is robust and I think 80 or 90% cheaper. And most importantly, all kinds of mischief that goes on on Wall Street can't go on here. We gotta do it like this right here. I feel like we're in this historical moment, maybe even a biblical moment. Byrne has never shied away from these sorts of over-the-top predictions, which is why so many people inside the Bitcoin world want in on the party. Ten years ago, I got in a fight with Wall Street and got them really angry at me. And now, do it again. That's Vice News Tonight for Wednesday, March 21st.